Hello, welcome, welcome back to Quack Talk. I'm Crystal here and I am still in Hong Kong. And today we're going to be connecting Hong Kong to the States through the concept of what it means to be Asian American. Okay, well, so Asian American, let's just say that in Hawaii, we have so many Asians there that it's really not even an issue. Um, in the West, you know, also, I grew up in the West and there's been mostly a lot of Asian Americans. In fact, there were 45% in the West and on the East Coast, a little bit less. But what happens in Hong Kong? We don't think about what does it mean to be Asian American in an Asian space when we're seen, and I say we, as in people who are Asian American, um, are seen as a strangely perpetual foreigner and yet connected through culture, but not quite. So it's very, very ambiguous. So I've got my perfect guest today to talk about this in-between space, teetering between Asian and Asian American. And I have this just, I don't know, this is an old, old friend. So we're going to go way back and let me just introduce her. She was a former TV presenter. Yes, in Hong Kong. But I just learned that she was a former model in Hawaii. Whoa. Um, she is a columnist. She, she's a writer. She's a comic, but she doesn't admit it. She was a radio host, charity founder, voiceover artist, all that great stuff, and a mother of three. So, all right, let's welcome Gloria. Welcome to Think Tech. Hello. Uh, so we are friends. Very yes, and and let me just um, premise that I know Gloria is usually like, you know, she she you just took your vaccination. So I'm just gonna say, if there's any reason you feel any weird vibes from Gloria, it's because she threw up all night, right? And you do not look like you're sick at all. So I'm just gonna give that to you. Yeah, I have never been sick with a vaccination. I have no idea why this one hit me so hard. But uh, anyway, I'm here. Yay, yay. And you know what? Uh, I'm just thinking, like, just to kind of go start off tangent, is this whole COVID thing brought about this really, you know, in the States, an anti-Asian discrimination, you know, with Trump and the Kung Flu and all that crap. So um what does it mean to be discriminated against, you know, because we have been living or you have been living in Asia for so long, uh, you know, to take it into a different context of not maybe discrimination is not the word, but feeling like an outsider. Can you talk a little bit about how you first came to Hong Kong and why first? So I first came to Hong Kong as um, a bit of a shopping spree, come out here, hang for a bit. And then I was uh, shopping in one of these shopping areas and a woman came out to me and said, would you like to make some money doing a commercial? So I said, sure, why not? More shopping. And then I just kind of snowballed from there and I kept saying to my parents, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. And I just kept getting more and more work. And then from modeling, it went to uh, being a television presenter. And then from there, I started to work as a columnist for the newspapers. And then I had children and you just don't want to uproot your children. And I also wanted them, I thought this is a good opportunity for them not to be like me because I cannot speak Cantonese in Hong Kong, which is a, a whole different story. But uh, yeah. No, no, that's part of the story. Let's talk about that. So because language barriers, that's a big part of why we're judged. You know, when I first came out here too, um, you know, my my Chinese was a little, I, I had a little, mine was better than yours because my dad's from Hong Kong. So I had all oh, that con- better. Okay, but still, all right, but you're Mandarin speaking, so there's a difference. You have the Chinese background, but it wasn't Cantonese. The point is, for um, there's a na- there's a term for us. They call it this. I don't know. if They told you that. Jok sing meaning bamboo, which is implying it's like we look Chinese on the outside, but we're kind of empty and hollow on the inside. It's so derogatory. But then they love to use that term. Hey, jok sing hui. You know, I don't know anything. Yeah, not you know. Um, so did you get that when you first came out here? They used to even say that I didn't look Chinese. And even now, especially if I wear a mask or something, people will immediately speak to me in English. They don't even bother speaking to me in Chinese. So I, I didn't speak um, Putonghua. I spoke um, Shanghainese at home, which does oh. absolutely no good in Hong Kong at all. And I was trying to learn to speak Cantonese and people get frustrated with me and just say, oh, fine, let's just speak English. Because they said not only... Did I have a very funny accent when I spoke Cantonese, but it sounded also that I had a bit of a Shanghainese accent. So, so was your Shanghainese accent almost like Americanized Shanghainese too? So it wasn't even like proper Shanghainese or was it proper Shanghainese at Hong Kong people didn't know about? What is very interesting was I thought, okay, I grew up speaking Shanghainese. My grandmother didn't speak any English, so I could speak Shanghainese to her. 
And then I ended up um, going to Shanghai and I started speaking and they all started laughing and they said, you sound like a really old, old woman, like a hundred year old woman. I was like, what? And they said, um, because in Shanghai, the slang goes very, very, very quickly and it moved and I just didn't know any of the slang. So here I am saying stuff like money, but now the word for money in Shanghainese is, is uh, like a ticket, like a train ticket. And I didn't know any of that slang. And so they said that the way that I pronounce things was almost like, I don't know, I guess you can compare it to Elizabethan English or something. So they- How do you say it? I got no money in Shanghai. Is it it? No, something like that. You don't say di anymore. So it's Oh, see? Yeah. So, wow. Okay. So it's very, very different. And then they would look at you like, and, and then you would start speaking. I would start speaking. And then little by little, you see the person's head kind of going like this because they didn't understand what I was saying. So then people said, oh, it's just easier to speak to you in English. So um, I didn't have that opportunity to kind of improve my Chinese because people just got frustrated and just started speaking to me in English. Okay, but back up to your parents. So were they first uh, gener? You were first generation because your parents, your mother is from Shanghai. And where's your dad from? Can you get a little bit of context to how the diaspora affected who you are? So both of my parents, this is an interesting story as well. So both of them were born in Shanghai. My father was in the British section. My mother was in the American section. They kind of diverged. So when when um, the communists came, my father was the oldest son. So he was sent to Taiwan and he went to school in Taiwan. My mother came across the border to Hong Kong, which is why she can speak Cantonese. My father couldn't speak it at all. So that's why I never really even heard it at home or or anything like that. And then um, they met in New York on, uh, my mother was on that show to tell the truth. I don't know what kind of, yeah. and you could find it on YouTube. So some, somebody has been loading all the old episodes onto YouTube. And so it's pretty amazing to be able to see your parents speaking because back then we'd all, we would have movies, but you don't have anything where you could actually hear them speaking. And um, my, my mother was uh, playing, um, I think she was impersonating a Korean airline pilot. So because what right back then in the States, Asian is Asian, you, you know, she could pretend she's right. Korean, whatever it was. And my dad happened to be watching the program with my mother's cousin. In, and, in, in, in New York, curse at the studio. No, in New York on TV. They were watching it on TV. Oh, okay. And All right. He said to my mom's cousin, oh, she's kind of hot. And he goes, oh, I know her. I can introduce you. And then ta-da. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, interesting. But, it, you know, I mean, aside from the really entertaining fact that they got through media that, you know, that the show that put them together, that the movement of people historically, you know, this is the thing about um, the crappy American history that people are built to learn is we don't really fully understand how the Asian Americans became what we are today right like so why are some people from taiwan why are there some from shanghai that went to taiwan or went to hong kong and you just explained it in your personal parent story um right and and what did that mean to you because then like you said you didn't grow up speaking cantonese um your mom you spoke shanghainese at home partly but not having that chinese language did that rob you of your cultural connection to your chineseness or did you feel that that wasn't you know can you speak to the language issue well i i thought it was interesting because i was the oldest child so i went to a uh, nursery school and then one day my mother got a call and they said uh, she's wet her pants come and get her because you can't be in the school if you wet your pants and my mother got into the car with me and said why did you do that i know you know how to go to the bathroom and i said yeah i told her i had to go but she just kept looking at me and then um she said what what exactly did you say and when i said it I had told the woman in Shanghainese because as, as a two-year-old, you, you know, you don't think, oh, there's different languages. I thought there's just a different way of saying things. So apparently I said in English, I need to go to, and then I said bathroom in English. I mean, I, sorry, I said, I need to go to in English and then bathroom in, in Shanghainese. So they didn't know what I was saying. And so then my parents said that because of that, they didn't want me to get confused. And because, you know, immigrants want their children to assimilate into their country, into their new country to right. So yeah. then they decided, okay, right, we're going to only speak to her in English. But it's interesting how that has evolved, right? Because our generation back then, there was that, that big 
capital A word, assimilation. It was the way to survive. It was the way to show that we wouldn't be made fun of if we had, you know, um, accents or, or a lack of understanding of American culture. And yet now the younger generation, the next generation, I should say, um, embrace like your, you embrace that Chinese culture. You instilled, you made sure your parent, your kids all learned Chinese well. So is it because you're compensating for what you didn't have or you recognize obviously the need for it in today's world? Yeah, it's when I first came to Hong Kong and I started working and especially as a television presenter, people used to say to me, oh, it's too bad you can't speak Cantonese because there would be so many more opportunities for you. And um, they kept saying, you should try to learn, you should try to learn. And I'm just, I'm just not one of these people who are very good at languages. My brother is amazing at different languages. He can pick it up very quickly. I'm just one of those people who can't. So I figured- Can we just insert that your brother is Daniel Wu with people who don't know? <laughs> The same, the same. But right in there, right? Yeah. So, um, so he can pick up all these languages. He did very, very well. I mean, I, I did okay, but uh, there were more opportunities. And, um, and I just said to my kids, you know, I, I think that if you try to learn another language, it's going to make your world a lot bigger. And, as you know, over time, the world has become a lot bigger with travel and all this stuff. And uh, just having that opportunity to be able to speak two languages, you could do whatever you want, but you're going to have more opportunities if you're bilingual. Yeah. Also, you know, I want to just add the word transnational in here because living in Hong Kong now, as you know, the flow of mainland Chinese coming over too has shifted the language uh, vibes here. Also, you see you're more Mandarin than Cantonese. And so even in that sense, within Chinese culture, there is that that difference of language. Like, okay, so everybody needs to learn Mandarin now. It's not just Cantonese. You know, the, the domestic helpers need to learn, you know, they have to speak English, Cantonese, and Mandarin. And, but it's just really fascinating how things are flowing and changing and shifting. Yeah. And 25, 30 years ago, it, it, people didn't like it when, when you spoke Putonghua, right? In yes. Hong Kong. They really didn't like it. And so my, because my father couldn't speak Cantonese, one time he came over and I had something wrong with my light switch. So he said, okay, take me to the hardware store. And, um, and I'll get whatever part it is that you need. So he walked in there and he said to the woman in Putonghua, I need whatever. And she turns around and she says, oh, husband, uh, you talk to this China guy. I don't want to talk to him <laughs> like that. And I thought, thank God my father doesn't know what she's saying because yeah. he wouldn't It's so be happy hard. about it. Yeah, but she just completely ignored him. But I think it's an it's an economic thing, right? I mean, a lot of this stuff, it's even for my kids too, right? I want them to have uh, the ability to speak different languages because I would like them to have better econom economic opportunities. Um, it's the same as in Hong Kong. People started realizing, oh, there's a lot of people coming in here and they're speaking Putonghua. So we need to start at least being able to provide whatever it is that they need and, and or at least understand and, and that kind of stuff. So I think- well, How does it make, sorry. Yeah. I see I cut you off. But how, how does it make you feel when like, you know, going back to the U.S. context and again, the rise of these very narrow minded kind of um, right wing uh, conservatives who say, go back to your country, you know, when they feel like the ethnic minority is a, a threat to their stable white center, you know, does that make you feel like things haven't really changed and you know why is there still this ongoing perpetual um foreigner kind of um narrative going on in the states i could talk to you for hours about this because i'm very disappointed with the way things are going in the states i actually sat down with my father um before he passed away and we were kind of uh he he had some friends that were living in um in california where where he lives very nice area very well educated people the two aunties, Chinese, were in their 80s, sitting there waiting for the bus, and the this guy walked by and spit on them. This was during kind of the height of COVID and said, this is all your fault. And um, and he was yelling and screaming at them. And, and uh, my father and I were talking about it because it was in their little local newspaper about how, how badly these women were treated. And my father said, I know these people, and these this is not the America that I came to. Um, he says, when I first came to the States. And then when we first moved to the West Coast, he said, we saved money and we bought um, a house up in the Berkeley Hills. We were the only Chinese in that neighborhood. He said, everyone came and welcomed us and they were very interested. He said, okay, you know, there were some stereotypes. They asked us if we were running a laundry 
Um, when I said I was an engineer, he thought I was a train engineer, <laughs> you know, not an electrical. <laughs> oh, because you were a laborer, came over for the gold rush? <laughs> Is that right? Traditionally, a lot of the Asians that first came over or the Chinese that first came over to California, especially on the railroads, they were working in farms. And, and um, so then there was this new wave of people that came over, like my parents, who had come for school who came to study in the United States, who were educated and uh, had other types of jobs. So he, but they were very welcoming, maybe curious, uh, not understanding, but still welcoming. And so for my father to say that, you know, this is how it's turned out, what, 50 years now, he said, it's such, it's not the United States that your mother and I wanted to come to, to, to raise children in. It's so sad to see them see that too, to see that cycle when it's building up the the immigrant life of the kind of all American greatness or whatever that is, um, and and seeing it shift and and come back around and 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 actually reverse itself. Um, but you know, you remember that case? Well, there are several, but um, with this older guy who was uh, assaulted. I don't know where was it, San Francisco. But anyway, long story short, is he decided to move back to China. He said, I'm fed up with this country. This is just yeah. So yeah, it's just interesting to see the attitudes like your father, um, seeing the kind of the unfortunate consequences of where we're going today. So let's switch it back. Let's go back to Asia and, and thinking about when we first uh, moved over here, um, you know, Hong Kong was a very fun place at the time, right? It was at the peak of kind of um, glory and it was just so fun and there are opportunities everywhere and for us being Asian American going back to that point is that I feel like and 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 you know correct me if I'm wrong that we were almost like the exotic other in a sense that there weren't that many Asian Americans here at the time and they treated us with curiosity like okay so we got away I, I got away with saying ridiculous things on TV, <laughs> whereas a local Chinese water, they go, oh, she's just the, the Western side of her. She can exactly. talk about yeah. sex. Right? Did you feel <laughs> Yeah. No, there was there were a lot of things that they just kind of rolled their eyes and thought, oh well, she's a foreigner. She doesn't understand. Fine. Whatever. We'll we'll let it we'll let it go. Right. And then uh, and then there was the other side of well, you know, you really should learn a little bit of this, whatever the culture is or, or whatever the language is. And try to assimilate a bit more. But, you know, when you go out, when we first came here, it was just partying, right? Making right. money, just partying. So I didn't care. It was like, it was, I, I made money and uh, I could go okay. out. Speaking of partying, how many times were you approached by some colonized British guy, not colonized, a colonizer, British guy who came up to you and says, oh, your English is so good. Uh, no, it used to happen all the time. I used to, I was on the uh, peak tram one time and these, uh, these Southern women got onto the tram and then they, they kept commenting about how cold it was. So I thought, oh, I'll just, and they were old ladies. So I kind of leaned over and I said, oh, don't worry. Once the train starts going, the windows will close and it went, oh my God, your English is so good. <laughs> And then it was like, Ethel, Ethel, come over here. Listen, say something, say something. And you're like, uh, uh, uh. And so then I said, um, I said, oh, no, I, I was born in the States. That's why my English is so good. And she said, you're all lucky for you. And I thought, huh. <laughs> yes. How fortunate of you to be able to hurt to the American. Yeah. yeah. And then back what then. Why do people don't were... know that, though? Why? Are they like that? Because well, there are still people today who still have that, that kind of attitude. Yeah, because they're they're not thinking outside the box. They're only experiencing what they what they grew up where they haven't really traveled that much. They're not that worldly. But I find that um, now it's a lot different. There's a lot more people who are at least a bit more worldly. At least the ones that that kind of travel and at least yeah. want to come out here. I mean, the ones that don't want to come out here and are not open to anything new, right? So, um, but it's... You know, I feel like there's like an invisibility of that, of of the idea of being Asian American in some places, um, in Asia. Um, what I mean is like, you know, so when I went to Shanghai to, to screen my film not too long ago, I went to NYU Shanghai, which just, you know, it's an interesting international um, body of students who are half local nationalists and half international. And I spoke to some of the Asian Americans there 
And they said that they're an invisible group because they're American, but they're not quite American. The locals see them. They see their face as being Chinese, but then they don't recognize the difference. I mean, or, or they recognize the difference, but then they'll say, okay, so then you're American. But then when it comes to job markets or representing America, they're not white Americans. And so they're kind of like, they slip into this funny category. And it's just interesting to see that. Invisible. Yeah, my friends and I, we used to call it the twilight zone. You weren't really Chinese. You weren't really Western, um, and uh, where where do you fit in? So you just have to kind of carve a niche for yourself. Um, and having the language really, really makes a difference. So my kids, especially my oldest one, they don't think he looks Asian at all. And uh, all of a sudden, he starts speaking Potoma or, or Cantonese, and they're going, wah, wah, wah. And, uh, oh, and yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, so... And that, that's the other thing. Um, when when you see a Westerner who speaks really bad in Chinese, they go, wow, so good. And then if yeah, I... Yeah, they can just say ni hao, and then it's like, wow. Yeah, and then if I speak Cantonese, they're like, oh, your accent's so horrible. Oh, I could tell that you're Shanghai Nese and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. You're held at a different level than everybody else. So it's a bit unfair also as well. So I don't know. We just... Yeah. with it do you see it well how do you think do you think it's changed like since you've come to hong kong uh when of course you know hong kong has been shifted in, in in so many ways but in today's uh context of being asian american in hong kong how do you navigate it how do you um you know when you go to the, the local wet market and and talk to these local ladies like how do you how do you make yourself seen i bring my son and <laughs> let him do all the talking <laughs> He's the one who goes to the wet markets and, and bargains and things like that. But uh, yeah, because it, it goes back to the language again. And you really do need to to speak the language. I mean, there's some really, really nice people and they've gotten to know me. I live in the same place for a really long time. I go to these shops. They know who I am. They go, they just kind of go, Ugh. you know, there's the, the Gwai Paul, which is the, the foreigner. <laughs> well, let's talk about that term because... Well, we say guai lo, guai paul. So guai is the word ghost in ca Chinese character. Paul is like lady, right? Do you find that derogatory? Or do you find that just, okay, it's just a, a term of endearment for people who don't speak Chinese, who are just, you know, foreigners, foreign ladies? It is, it is what they use here. So you just get used to it. I mean, I wouldn't really want to be called that all the time, but what, what can you do? So, um, and then you'll hear it all the time. It's just, and people will say, oh, um, that's, that's not a good term. It's, you know, it's, it's not politically correct. And, and people go, what else am I supposed to say? Right. Yeah, so, and yeah, it's yeah. a very wide term. So you could be British, you could be Jamaican, yeah. you could whatever, and you're still a white pole. So as long as you're not born and raised here, then you're a Gwai Paul. If you if and you yet, sometimes you're very Chinese. So we were talking last time I saw you um, <laughs> that you had rearranged your son's room because for some reason you thought he needed to the feng shui to be right, and he went in and is like your the bed's like completely the opposite direction. And so there was some very deeply rooted Chinese traditional thinking in your body. Yeah. <laughs> and where does that come from? And how do you navigate? You know, so how much are you Chinese? How much are you American? Yeah, I think um, you take the best of both cultures. So I had um, a Chinese parents who didn't quite teach me that much, but my grandparents did. And they would, they would say, okay, well, you need to do this or, or that. But, um, and then I have a father who was an engineer. So he's very kind of straight forward thinking. He's like, oh, so I know that doesn't mean anything. And then my mother who really believed in all that. So um, yeah, so what we were talking about was because my son is, uh, my second son, is born in the year of the dragon, which is not supposed to be a good year for him. So he's, he, I've made him wear this pendant <laughs> and because why not, right? If it helps, it helps. And so that's what I'm going to take from, from the Chinese culture. And then, um, and then if he wears it, that's great. But, uh, you know, might as well just kind of increase the benefits of whatever is, is going on. So if this is going to help him, sure, I'll change his room around. I should have told him first before he walked into the bedroom. <laughs> well, that's a bit. <laughs> so you know, so now you have you have three kids. They're biracial. They speak um, multiple languages. How? What are your expectations of them navigating space? Because two out of three of them are in 
Hong Kong right now, right? So it's interesting to see them kind of having, um, being educated here in an international school with a Chinese, you know, slant, and then going to the U.S. for college and then coming back. What do you, how do you think they're going to navigate the life as multicultural people today with language? Well, I think that they, they've already got a much better step up than I ever did. So they, because they can read and write, I mean, reading and writing is also important for Chinese. And then, um, and then being able to speak, I, I always said to them, I don't mind whatever job that you're going to get, but I really do want you to learn the language because that will benefit you. Whether you're a hairdresser, you'll be able to get more clients if you can, if you can speak different languages. If you want to be a laborer, that's fine too. Or if you want to be a, a data science technician or whatever, that is definitely going to help you. So it was more about giving them that extra kind of boost. And, um, you know, statistically, they say that it's better for children to learn languages when they're younger. I started in and when I was at Berkeley and it was just too hard. I had a full course load and I was trying to learn Chinese and trying to read and write. It was it was very, very difficult. So that's why I wanted them to go straight into it. So they were in a bilingual school and, um, wow. and it was pretty full immersion, bilingual immersion. So, um, then it was, yeah, no, it's impressive. And, you know, when I had dinner with you and your boys and, you know, they were able to order low in a, you know, local dive, you know, that's where you feel pride because it's like, Hey, my boys know how to navigate the space and you don't feel yeah. like an outsider because of the language. So it goes back to that. And yeah. I think it also goes back to how much effort we make, but, you know, not to, um, criticize people who don't have the language, right? Because a lot of people don't have access to it. Um, in the States, you know, there is not that support system, perhaps, even if you want to, you know, like my, you know, I want my son to learn more. There's nobody speaking to him in it. Is that an excuse? I don't know. But I think the way the world is going in the way we are all um, interconnected through, you know, virtual spaces and, and global kind of, there's, there's no excuse to not learn. But I think you pointed out some very important points about um, language and its connection to culture. So I think we want to leave it at that because we have time is up, but um, it's just really fascinating. And I think like you said, we could go on forever and ever to think about the wonderful past in Hong Kong in the glory days and being kind of an outsider in a place that is our culture and yet not and going back to the States and seeing it the other way too. So we need to have more of these conversations and um, really appreciate this is Gloria Wu sharing her thoughts on just being kind of in between spaces and embracing both and being everything at the same time. So thank you so much for your time, Gloria. Thank you.